the previous episodes, our guest speakers have given us different insights about the universal wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. The dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna evoked authenticity, keys to time management, to success. The Gita helped us understand how to reach out to the feminine energy in us for our own evolution. We learned that the study of ancient texts of yoga is a part of the practices that a yoga practitioner should undertake. Om Shri Krishna Parabrahmane Namaha Shri Mad Bhagavad Gita Atha Dviti Yodhyayaha Sankhya Yoga Arjuna Uvacha Sthita Pragnasya Kabhasha Samadhisthasya Keshava Sthita Dhikim Prabhasheta Kimasita Vrajeta Kim As a last episode to this series, let us try to understand in which way the Bhagavad Gita is related to yoga. All the chapters bear the name Yoga. What does this mean? How is the Bhagavad Gita related to yoga? Okay, well, what does the Gita have to do with yoga? This is a really interesting question because if you go back to the origins of the Gita, what it was originally, There were six or seven slokas, there were no titles, there were no chapters. It was very simple. And uh, Vyasa then took the essence of what was communicated heart to heart through transmission, through Krishna's transmission to Arjun. And he sort of padded out the essence of it into a set of slokas that then eventually became what we know today as the Bhagavad Gita. So originally, there were just directions to Arjun on the battlefield of how to overcome his sorrow, his dilemma. You know, that you can imagine the poor man, he's standing, staring at his relatives, his guru on the other side, thinking of all the death and destruction, of all the children who are going to suffer because of all this and going, I don't want to do this. And he needed help in the moment. He needed warrior's help. You know, in, in the Gita, Lord Krishna tells him to meditate here on the point of power in the system so that he can come out of this. Uh, not that we meditate on the point of power now, we meditate on the heart because what's needed now is something different. But yoga in the sense that everything that was then derived from this transmission on the battlefield has been segregated into chapters now those chapters originally had no titles but they do now and some people give them yoga titles some people don't but they're all related to the main areas of yoga what are the main areas of yoga how are the shlokas divided so if you look at it, the first six chapters are what you could call karma yoga. They focus on, first of all, the dilemma, which is the inaction of Arjun. And of course, inaction in itself is a decision, is an action to do nothing. So he's, he's in the freeze response, you could say. 
when you don't know what to do, when things are scary, when survival's at stake. Arjun freezes at the beginning, and this is the basis for which the Gita proceeds. So what happens next? So Krishna talks to him, and he starts out with, you could say the second chapter is the, the yoga of the soul's immortality, the nature of life, death, self-realization, self-awareness, all those things, knowledge and philosophy. So we start with this. This is the aspect of yoga that deals with the purpose of our life and the context of this life in the bigger picture. But then very, very quickly by Chapter 3, it's moved to Karma Yoga, the yoga of action. And this, you know, these two chapters, 2 and 3, are where Daji says, that, you know, these core seven, six or seven slokas come from, this part of the Gita where Lord Krishna is giving him this guidance that, okay, yes, people are going to die, but don't look at it in this narrow, limited view. Let's look at, you know, the whole of creation and what's happening here. So chapter three is about the yoga of action, selfless service and dharma, this idea of dharma that is just pervades the Bhagavad Gita, of the sense of duty, of divine principles in action. You know, what is our destiny? What is free will? All these aspects of what we call kaushalam or excellence of, you know, excellence, skill in action, this idea and virtue associated with that, which of course are all the core components if you look back at uh, the other yogic texts like Patanjali or the Ashtavakra Gita or any of these, you find this idea of virtue of, uh, you know, for Patanjali, the Niyamas and getting rid of the Yamas, Dharma as duty, you know, all these things are a very, very important aspect of yoga. If we move to chapters four, five and six, we're still looking at yoga in action, still looking at Karma Yoga. But looking at the wisdom side, uh, at renunciation, and then finally at our practice, you know, the practice of dhyana, of meditation, and the importance of that in karma yoga uh, to get to self-realization. So this first part, these first six chapters are all about this, the practice side, the doing, the wisdom in action, etc., Prajahati yada kaman Sarvan partha manogatan Atman yevatmana tushtaha Sthita pragnyasta dochyate Dukheshvanu Vigna manaha Sukeshu vigatas praha Vita raga bhaya krodha Stita dir muni ruchete The next set of chapters are where this then moves from the karma, the action part, into what's called bhakti yoga. So we're meditating now, right? We've got to dhyan, and then from there, the development, which is one of the, you know, the yogic sadhanas, the sadhana chatustya of viveka, of through dhyan, of coming to vinyana, to wisdom, ultimate truth or what's known in terms of our subtle bodies as buddhi our discernment our choices and consequences and then we continue on through bhakti yoga into the yoga of devotion the importance of devotion to the supreme deity to you know you don't even have to think of it as god if you're not religious it's also this idea of the mysterious unknown, the greater unknown, the part of our existence that we cannot understand, which has been given the name of God. Um, <clears throat> this awareness and 
realization that from this unknown is what everything comes from. And in yoga, it's the idea of the divine creation, the divine manifestation. And then, of course, through that, this cosmic vision that Lord Krishna showed Arjuna on the battlefield to wake him up, to say, okay, this is reality. I mean, Arjuna couldn't bear it. He said, go back to your normal form again. I can't stand this. But he needed that wake-up call, that shock, that there's something beyond mundane existence. And I think this is what's really relevant for us also in our modern-day life, that sometimes we get so caught up in the mundane that we forget about this cosmic vision. And it takes, you know, the divine to come and show us, wake up, get out of your mundane reality and look at the other dimensions of your existence before we really do something useful with our lives. So the bhakti part, the devotion part, the love, the enthusiasm that pervades everything you do is what these chapters 7 to 12 are all about. How do we integrate this into our life? How do we let, okay, if you think of the word enthusiasm, which means to put God into, and theos, theos means God in Greek, enthusiasm, that inspiration, that passion for living is what Bhakti Yoga is all about. And that's chapters 7 to 12 of the Gita. Apuryamanam achala pratishtam Samudramapa pravishanti yadvat Tadvat kamayam pravishanti sarve Sashanti mapnoti nakamakami Vihaya kamanya sarvan Pumam sharati nispruha Nirmamo nirahankara Sashanti madhi gachati The final section, chapters 13 to 18, which is Jnana Yoga, the yoga of knowledge or... or um, yeah, knowledge isn't the right word. It's it's um, I can't think of it. It's it's productive knowledge, knowledge that's taking you towards the state of being of yoga of oneness. So what happens here? First of all, Lord Krishna talks to him about the ego and the soul, individual consciousness and universal consciousness. These two aspects of the human being identity and going beyond into the nothingness. Then he carries on with the three gunas, the yoga of the three gunas, the various states of our material existence, which is sattva, rajas and tamas, and the masculine and feminine, purusha and prakriti, these energies of the universe. So the feminine's there in that also. This balance, the need for balance between the male and female energies within nature and within us as well. And how the gunas affect the ego but not the soul. So they're there in our existence as identities, as individual beings. He then goes on to talk about the supreme purusha, the realisation of truth of sat and of good and evil, the dualities of existence, of how these three gunas play out in our daily life, in our thoughts, in our deeds, even in our eating habits, for example. And then finally, the very last chapter is what's known as the, the yoga of liberation and renunciation. Whereas saranagati, the yogic concept of surrender, is just beautiful. It's like, you know, being able to, being held, being supported, um, not having to have that burden of responsibility of dharma. And this comes back to the fruitless action thing. You have your duty, but you're not burdened by your duty because it's a joyous thing. You're carefree. You're free. You don't have the responsibility 
in that individual sense of I am responsible because everything is given to the Lord. So it's a very, very joyous, very different feeling and that's really how the Gita ends. So um, all of it is yoga because all of it falls under karma, bhakti and jnana yoga. Esha Brahmi Sthitif Partha Nainam Prabhya Vimuhyati Sthitva Syam Antakalepi Brahma Nirvana Mruchati our esteemed guest speakers for their immense contribution and insights all along this series living waters we hope that you have been inspired to have a closer look at the treasures that the bhagavad gita can offer Om Namo Narayana.